Hello and welcome. Today I want to talk about MIDI controllers. It's something that's been on my mind a lot lately. Um, I've been thinking about uh, kind of the, the ideal MIDI controller for what I want to do, what this perfect uh, control surface would look like for me, and it's got me thinking about all the ones I already own, which is quite a few as you can see here, and it's got me also shopping around for some new ones as well. So basically I just wanted to kind of go through and digest some of my thoughts on this and uh, you know, this this is going to be not really a review, more of just like pointing out little highlights and pros and cons of different approaches and the things I've tried and things like that. So to start off with, um, I think that the, the MIDI controller that uh, probably most people start with, and rightly so, is this one here. This is the Keystep. Uh, this is the original Keystep 32. And you see I just strap a little battery onto the side to make it that much more portable. And um, this one's definitely, it's the one I started with and it's very robust, very well made. Um, you know, it's got all your physical ports that you could want. Um, so really it's, if you're looking for just a keyboard, I think this is the one. And this is the one most people start with. It's really just got every feature you could want uh, and it's pretty low in price. So yeah, what's the problem, right? Why even go anywhere from here? Well, the, the thing that led me onto this whole kind of rabbit hole of looking at other stuff, First of all, this doesn't have any sort of drum pads or faders or any alternate controls like that. Um, it does have these few knobs, but they're not MIDI assignable. Uh, the newer model, Keystep 37, does have four MIDI assignable knobs, so that's at least addressed there. But in this version, really all you get is keys. Now, of course, there's the onboard sequencer and ARP as well, uh, which are fun. I tend not to use them that much, though, um, just because I have those things on other devices that I prefer. So in the sense of this being just a keyboard input, um, it's okay. Um, but it's just kind of, it doesn't do enough in the package or the form factor you get, which is kind of what led me to look for other things. But that said, this thing is, you know, very sturdy and dependable, and I keep it around just even as a, a backup or as a way to quickly attach a keyboard to something that doesn't have one. Um, it's just, it's really, really useful, reliable unit. So, in the sense that everybody probably should have a key step at some point. Um, my upgrade for the kind of traditional piano keyboard though like this, at least in the portable sense here, has been this one. This is the Yamaha Reface DX. And as far as I know, all the Yamaha Refaces have the same keyboard and the same MIDI capabilities. Um, so this, uh, what, what makes this one a little different is that it actually has a screen. And by the way, these ones all take internal batteries, which is nice, you don't have to plug anything in. Um, it has a screen which uh, allows you to like do simple things like change the output MIDI channel um, or the incoming MIDI channel without having to reboot the device and hold down certain key combos and stuff like the other Reface units have. So I'd say if you wanted one with one of its primary purposes being a MIDI controller, the DX is the one just because the screen makes it so much easier to use. But um, the thing I love about this one is the quality of these keys is so much better than the key step. Now, of course, it costs more, but it is also a pretty powerful synth in its own right. Um, but talking about it just as a MIDI controller, um, what I like about this is that the keys are about the same size, but when you, you can play them down here, but you can also play them at the top of the key. And the way I learned to play piano, I often play chords kind of high up like this, and so I like to be able to play the whole key up and down. On the key steps and the other Arturia ones, you can't do that. If you play at the top of the key here, you can feel it's actually just like a hinge. So it doesn't really work. You have to be kind of at least a quarter of the way down the key in order for it to, to like work properly. So I just, I've just found that this one is more comfortable to play on. I think the velocity sensitivity is a little better. It does not have aftertouch, whereas this one does. I don't use aftertouch that much, so that's not a big deal to me. And I really like the physical pitch bend here, but it does miss the, the mod strip or mod wheel. Uh, that this one has. So, you know, pros and cons on things. But generally, in terms of a kind of carry around keyboard type MIDI controller, the Reface DX has become my favorite. Um, and just because I, I really love the quality of the keys. And I also love the quality of the internal synth. Um, it also has audio input, so I can route other synths through it, um, which is really handy for, you know, small setups and portable setups and things like that. Um, it does do uh, MIDI over USB. So if you plug it into a USB device host, um, you can just have a USB cable coming out and have all your MIDI that way. Um, the physical MIDI is this, uh, let me grab the thing. So the physical MIDI out the back is this like eight pin thing, which kind of looks like an S video port to me. 
and then it splits out into you know this two standard kind of five pin midis and i will say this is definitely the worst part about this if you have to deal with this cable it's just annoying and ugly um i wish they had used trs midi or five pin mini either way would have been better but oh well can't have everything so um this this cable is a monstrosity but it does do usb midi just fine and so if you have the ability to use that i would recommend that instead okay so moving on from those traditional keyboard uh piano style midi controllers um next this is my little collection of slimline controllers and now i really like the kind of size and shape of these they're super portable um, and they're they're also pretty robust in the sense of like it's you know most of these are kind of they're just hard plastic but it's so small that it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to mess it up so I, I found that these to be plenty sturdy as well I'll throw them in a bag and not worry about it too much um, now what really opened up kind of the world of these slimline controllers for me was this the black box uh, this is the primary thing that I use these types of controllers for because the black box has uh, USB host capabilities, meaning you can plug a, a USB only MIDI controller directly into it, and it has MIDI learn internally, so you can pretty quickly map out whatever you want that controller to do. And that's a huge feature that uh, I wish was standard on every synth, unfortunately not. Um, it's, it's kind of becoming more common, uh, but there's still quite a lot of stuff that's released today that doesn't have that ability. So just because it has a USB port does not mean it has the USB host capabilities. So keep that in mind with some of these. So I'll start with these, these two middle ones. Um, these are the ones that only work with um, some, something that has USB host capabilities, which can be something like the black box. It can be, of course, any computer, tablet, or phone, any software. Um, and then you can also buy a, a dedicated USB host if you're trying to adapt to a different synthesizer or something that doesn't have that. But unfortunately, those dedicated hosts are pretty expensive too. They're generally in the like $60 to $100 range. So, you know, if you're like buying uh, a host for a MIDI controller that's worth like $50 or less, you know, it's, it's pretty significant. It could end up being more than the cost of the MIDI controller quite easily. So I try to avoid that. And that's one of the things I really love about the black box. Um, but anyway, to start with, of my Slimline Connect collection, this one's probably overall my favorite, and it um, it gets the most use, I think. Um, so basically what this one does is, uh, let me give you a little close-up. Okay, so this one, the Nano Control 2, is a Slimline MIDI controller that's designed to give you the controls from your... Um, uh, kind of the, the mixer and transport section of a DAW. So you've got all your transport controls here, switch between tracks, set markers, turn loop on and off, and then all of your kind of uh, solo mute record arm. And then traditionally the faders would be set to level or volume and the knobs to uh, panning. Well, the way I like to use it is uh, more of just a mixer control. And so I do keep these as level or volume, but I generally set these as filter cutoff. And sometimes I even set them up as like macro knobs to control multiple parameters at once. And uh, for the black box specifically, that is a setup that works very, very well. And so that's the primary way that I use this basically is controlling levels uh, within the black box. And then for um, it's related to that Porta Studio workflow uh, video that I already made on this little combo. So I like this a lot and it gets a lot of use for me um, specifically for this one type of workflow. So this next one I got um, also with the black box in mind. Again, it's only USB out, so it has to connect to a USB host. And this one, uh, you know, it's, it's velocity sensitive drum pads and then a bank of eight knobs. And that's basically it. Um, these little buttons down here, you can toggle through different banks of what, the, what uh, MIDI notes the pads are sending, which is definitely helpful. You can also have the pads send MIDI CC values and program change values. So you could use this as like kind of a master controller for triggering you know, sequences or loops or longer things like that as well. It doesn't have to be just like one shot finger drumming type stuff. Um, now I got this used on eBay and my uh, K1 knob right here, knob one, doesn't work unfortunately. It doesn't send any MIDI data. Um, I'll try some contact cleaner in there and see if I can get it to work. But basically I've just been using it, you know, minus that one. And it's still been pretty good. And it's, um, again, it's a nice little companion for the black box. Just gives you more hands-on tactile control, really easy to map it out. Um, but being USB only, I can't hook it up into anything else unless I add a USB host to it. Okay, so this one here, this is the um, 
Keith McMillan QNexus Red. So this is the second generation of the QNexus. And this one has a whole ton of features. It's actually pretty similar to the, um, to the Keystep in a sense, in that it has internal ARP, internal sequencer, um, and it's also designed to be an MPE controller. And so what that means is that um, you have velocity, you have aftertouch, and then you also have these other parameters, like you can slide up and down on these, kind of like a, kind of like a fader, really. Um, and then there's also, I believe, a roll parameter, like left and right, like that. And then like the pitch bend here too, this is kind of a roll type thing versus a more traditional pitch bend. Um, you can also have different banks of things, tons of presets. So like there's a ton of stuff you can do with this. Um, and really I've, I've only done kind of pretty basic things with it so far. So I haven't dove too deep into what it, what it can do. Um, I don't actually have any M MPE synths or instruments. So mostly what I've done is just use it as kind of a fancy MIDI controller. I will say that I was hoping that this one would be like the one for me because, you know, I can play keys on it and I can also use it as drum pads. Well, I will say I just kind of don't like it that much for playing keys because I realize that a lot of those chord shapes I'm used to don't translate uh, to these types of these like shapes of keys. I basically have to relearn how to play piano on this thing because um, I'm used to the keys being, you know, full length, like this key, for example, extending all the way down between these two um, or, you know, most of the way down. Right. And so I've just found it to be kind of a struggle to actually play piano keys in the way I'm used to on this. In terms of just like, you know, inputting and holding a chord or something, it's totally fine. But um, it wasn't quite as nice as I, as I was hoping. Um, the other thing is that in order to get traditional MIDI ports on this thing, you have to have this little MIDI expander, which, you know, it's, it's pretty tiny, but um, it's still just annoying that you need it. <laughs> it would be much nicer if there was just TRS ports directly on this thing. Um, there are plenty of 8th inch ports, right? So it's got like CV ports here. Come on, folks. So you got, these are both uh, CV out. And then you've also got a CV in uh, or pedal in on this side. And so it actually has plenty of TRS ports already. Just none of them are MIDI. Um, so you, you have to hook up a USB cable between the Q Nexus and the, uh, the MIDI expander here. And then you get your kind of traditional MIDI ports. So that's a bit of a pain. Um, but it does work, and uh, so, you know, that means that this will, uh, this will be able to connect directly to kind of older school synths if you want it to. And then through the USB-C on this side, you can go directly into something like the black box that has USB host capabilities, and that'll work just fine. So I would say really, I think the ideal use case for this one is if you are connecting to an iPad, um, because on, on an iPad, you would only need the single USB cable, and you would also have access to all sorts of software MPE cap compatible synths. And that's really where this thing is gonna shine is if you're using it with MPE stuff. So the way I'm using it, it's kind of a bit too basic. Like this thing is a bit more complex than I really need for, for what I'm looking for. So final one here, and this one I've actually made a couple of videos on already. I really like this. Um, this is the MPX-8 and it is, uh, it's a sample player. So it does actually have audio out ports and um, it plays, it has some internal memory, which is mostly 808 samples. And then you can also load an SD card in here and play samples from that. It's pretty basic in the sense of just like you hit the pad, you hear the sample, that's it. There's, there's no internal sequencer. There's like no features basically. But what I love about it, it's powered by USB. This is USB type B. Um, it does not do MIDI over USB. It's simply, that's simply a power port. Um, but it has these two TRS ports. Um, those are both MIDI in and out. And there is no MIDI through, unfortunately. That would also be super nice, but it does do MIDI out. And so basically you can hook this up directly to kind of whatever synth with the right MIDI adapter, and you will be able to control it directly. And uh, that's really nice. And so I've used this, and these, these drum pads are actually really nice quality. What I like is that they're big enough to fit two fingers on, um, and that's often how I like to, to play it. And like, I'm, I'm not an accomplished finger drummer at all, I just use them to kind of layer in drums. Um, I find that that's kind of a really fast and natural and intuitive way for me to add more layers of drums, especially more complex patterns like hi-hats and stuff. I really like doing on drum pads like this. They are velocity sensitive. There's no aftertouch. Um, but I just find this as like a, a little kind of unit is really nice. 
And now this whole side of it basically is just a waste. I'm not using any of that because I'm not using its sample capabilities, which is why I had high hopes for this one because it's basically the same drum pads, you know, in a more, in a better package. The problem though is that these drum pads actually have a little bit more travel. They're a little bit thicker. So in my opinion, these feel better to play. These are pretty darn close. They're not, you know, it's, they're about the same. But um, if I had, you know, between these two, I would definitely pick the MPX-8 as just being slightly better. And then the other thing is, again, this one's USB only. So I can only connect it to something with USB host capabilities, whereas this one uh, I can connect to anything, really. So I'm finding this one is just kind of more useful in a lot of settings. Yeah, so one of the primary ways that I like to use a drum pad input is for um, the Syntact, uh, or also I have the Digitone and the model samples but all of these uh, electron boxes, if I want to do drums on them especially, I really enjoy using drum pads for that. And so the best one, um, or my, my favorite one that I've been using so far is this MPX-8, um, because I just like, I like that I can connect it directly, and you know, it just fits pretty well under here. Like I said, I have a bit of wasted space here, but you know, having these mapped out to, uh, the, to the different drum tracks on here just works really well. Now in that category, I also have to bring up the Donner Starry Pad. So this is the one that I got most recently, and it was just kind of on a whim. It's um, it was on sale, and just you know thought, hey, why not? It can't be that bad. And uh, it turns out, yeah, it's really not. So the main things I like about it, it does have physical TRS MIDI out port, as well as a USB C port, which also does um, you know MIDI over USB. So it gets its power from the USB port, whether or not you're using the TRS MIDI port. And um, it works really quite well. Um, I would say the quality of these pads compared to the Akai ones are not quite as good, but I mean, for the price, they're not bad either. You can see they're a little bit physically smaller. Um, I definitely prefer the, the larger size of the Akai pads. And, uh, but it's still big enough to do two fingers on if you want to. And you can see they're really thick. There's a lot of travel actually in them, which I like a lot. So um, to me, they feel quite good to play on. You also have these two faders and these two um, rotary encoders for knobs. These are the detented uh, clicky style, um, which, which I like, and it's good for certain things. So here I have it um, hooked up into the, the black box's uh, device in port here. And um, so you can see with each of these, I have these buttons to cycle through my different knob banks, uh, fader banks, etc. There's three of them, and they're color-coded. And it's all highly customizable, so you can have these send, you know, different MIDI CC values. Uh, the pads can send MIDI notes or CC values. Um, really a lot you can do with that. And then it has the, you know, the note repeat, uh, like beat repeat type thing built in. And it also has a couple of other, like, uh, you know, transpose your octaves up and down. Um, these are for your, like, beat repeat type things. So there's really actually some pretty good features built in. Um, it's not a sequencer, it's just a, a MIDI controller but um, it has you know this kind of quality of life type things uh, which actually make it really nice build quality is on par with all all of these it's about the same kind of sturdy plastic feel and uh, it's just it's a really nice size actually you can see here compared to the syntact it's about the same width and slightly shorter than the syntact um, and it's about about double the height of you know these slimline controllers so it's actually a nice little package um, for, for portability, I think, and for just packing a lot of features in. Now, obviously, this is really designed for making beats. Um, you know, any pad controller is, and so the features on it are more designed for that. Um, uh, but that said, you could do melodics on it, and you know, each of these can just be a note value, and so you can play it as an isometric keyboard if you want to. So yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised with the Donner Starry Pad. I think the quality is good for the price and you know, it's a lot of good features. So I'm kind of starting to use it more and more as well. And then the final one that I have to mention here is the model samples. Um, and this would equally apply to the model cycles as well because their, their layout and their MIDI implementation is identical. Um, now this of course is its own instrument, um, but it's a really powerful MIDI sequencer as all the electron boxes are. Um, but uh, it also works pretty well as a MIDI controller especially with something like the black box that has MIDI learn because every one of these knobs um, as well as the, the you know the buttons and various things um, the pads they all can output 
MIDI note values or MIDI CC values. So the knobs are all hard coded to MIDI CC values, which you cannot change. So you have to plug it into something that does have a MIDI learn capability, like the black box does, or like any uh, DAW would. Um, but basically, if you just want a whole bunch of pretty good quality knobs for you know a pretty decent price, considering all the other things it does, I highly recommend this. It works really well. Um, just know that if you plug it into a synth that doesn't have MIDI learn, then it's just luck of the draw whether those you know, whether those CC values correspond to what you want them to control, chances are they're not going to. So you have to plug it into something that is a bit more flexible than what this is. Now, of course, when you upgrade to the, the Digi line of Electron stuff, this one is fully customizable. So you get this knob bank of eight knobs that you can send uh, MIDI CC values out and you can specify what value you want each knob to send. And then, of course, all the, the MIDI sequencing it has handled as well. Um, but this is, of course, price-wise, is in a whole other category. So, so I wanted to talk for a few minutes um, just on the kind of the philosophy uh, that I have with MIDI controllers. I think what interests me so much about them is uh, this idea of controllerism, like that you can kind of design your own instrument. So that term controllerism, it's it's mostly referring to uh, kind of the DJ world where um, people would get really good at uh, you know managing two turntables with the mixer and the crossfader between them and using tricks like uh, scratching and you know different different types of like DJ effects that it would figure out. And I think that's really cool. Um, in kind of more the, the synth world also, you can do a lot of similar things with the mixer, right? You can use the controls on the mixer. Maybe the mixer has some, some bits of EQ. Um, and so you can actually play a mixer as an instrument as well. And a lot of what I enjoy in MIDI controllers is that type of a mixer interface, which I think is why I like this fader one so much. And that's why I'm looking at other MIDI controllers that also give me more faders and better quality than what this one is. Um, as in terms of like drum pads, um, I, I like them. I just find it a, a very fast way to like get drum patterns down and to layer on them. But I'm definitely not an accomplished finger drummer whatsoever. And um, so I'm, you know, I can't comment that much on what it's like to finger drum on these because I'm just not that good at it. Um, but it's it's something that I really enjoy as a, I feel like it's just kind of a more natural and intuitive way to add drums versus purely sequencing them in. Um, so I like to mix both. I do some sequence drums, some kind of played in drums, and yeah, I mix both. Um, personally, I don't like playing drums on a piano keyboard. You know, I know you can use it that way. Uh, to me, it just doesn't make a lot of sense, so I don't do it that way. But yeah, on the this idea of kind of controllerism, what, what I find is so interesting about MIDI controllers, especially with something that's really flexible like uh, like the black box. The black box here is what got me really kind of hooked on uh, expanding the, my little collection of MIDI controllers here, specifically the ones that are pretty darn cheap. Like most of these here are under $100. A lot of them are even under $50 because they're older models, you know, like the LPD-8 here, this one uh, you can buy yeah, under $50 pretty much all day. There's tons of them out there. Um, and now there's also now, by the way, a new version of this, the LPD-8 II, which looks like it has upgraded pads and is only $60 brand new. So, I mean, they're pretty cheap overall. And um, yeah, and so like I, for me, a lot of these are cheap enough to be in just kind of that impulse buy category. And so I end up buying it if I see it um, and I'm attracted to do it at that point, price point, and then decide later if it's useful for me or not. And then other ones I buy more intentionally, like the Q Nexus here, I put a lot of research into it before buying because it was a lot more expensive. Um, and uh, But I, I'm finding though that with these MIDI controllers, the more complex it is, the less I use it. Um, because it's really the ones that are very straightforward where I can just, has, has a few controls, I can just quickly map them out into here. You can make your own kind of templates in here to, um, you know, to save those MIDI mappings. And then that's really what allows me to kind of open it up and with the black box in particular, it's really like this this platform upon which you can build your own music creation studio. Like it's a little mini kind of studio in a box. And so you can, um, you know, of course you can use it for drums, sample based drums, um, but you can also do various types of synthesis with it that are all based on samples. So like wave cycle synthesis, uh, you can do some wave table kind of stuff that has a granular synth engine in there. Um, it, it can be a, a pretty good polysynth because um, you have up to, 
what is it, 16 voices? I think it's up to 16 voices uh, per pad and a max of 32 voices for the whole unit. And so basically you can have a collection of like four to six to eight voice polysynths all in here, all playing simultaneously, and then control them from whatever style of control you want. Um, and because this can also take multiple MIDI inputs at once, you can have your USB as well as your TRS MIDI in, and it can listen to those things at once. And then there's certain ones too, like, um, like the key step, for example, you can make MIDI chains through it because it has a MIDI soft through, like you, anything that gets plugged into the MIDI in will also get passed out through the MIDI out. Fortunately, not everything does that, but a uh, key step is one that does. And so you can make these MIDI chains of devices to really create, um, like you can add a bunch of these things all talking at once and create whatever kind of custom control surface that you really like. So um, let me show you one of those real quick here. So this is a setup that I actually really like. I found that um, having my drum pads right in front of me, kind of in front of my keyboard, works well for a lot of the music that I make. And because I can daisy chain these two together, I can have the out come from into the in here and then the out go into something like the black box, that means I can use these both simultaneously. It's like having the keyboard and then adding the drum pads to it. And that works great. It only takes up a single MIDI import on whatever uh, you know synth you're trying to connect to. Um, now on this one, it's USB only, but again, it gives me faders and you know extra knobs. So it gives me more control over levels and mixing kind of as I'm playing. So these three together are a pretty good setup. It's kind of everything that I want and it's functionally uh, you know, practical. It work, works pretty well. Now it is a bit big and ungainly. And of course you can get a MIDI controller that combines a lot of these things into one unit. Um, but uh, I found that being able to kind of move these around and have them you know, separate is actually quite nice. So I think that's about all the thoughts I have to share. Um, on a fundamental level, I'm really excited about MIDI controllers because it means that you can take whatever synth and sounds you want and build your own custom interface for it. And for a lot of the things uh, you know, that we like, it just it makes the experience of making music more fun, more hands-on, and for me at least, it makes it kind of more fluid and natural uh, in a lot of cases. Like for example, I love my Volcas back here, but trying to actually play things in on these little touch pads just does not work for me. It's, I can't get the timing right, my finger hits too many of the pads, you know, it's just not great. Connect one of these to a MIDI controller and it's an excellent instrument. And the same goes for a lot of uh, budget gear. And that's why I love this kind of whole world of budget, small, portable MIDI controllers that pair well with budget gear.